Let me thank uh, Seema uh, very much for inviting me to be part of this panel and to deliver some um, introductory remarks. Now, uh, the theme I was given was how businesses need to recover after the terror attacks. And the thrust of my remarks is going to be to convince you that the basic macroeconomic fundamentals are in pretty good shape for you to build your businesses around it. So let me see whether I can make that uh, case effectively. But before doing that, I'll just uh, like to offer a few remarks on the security situation. Major General Ravi Priya is far, far more qualified than I am to speak about that, and clearly we all want to hear what he's going to say. But let me say that from the point of view of a, of a citizen, of a person working in the country, uh, there seems to be a great deal of normalcy that has now been restored. Certainly in the week after Vesak, uh, looking around Colombo, uh, things seem to be very much back to normal. And if you look at the, the whole characteristics of those heinous uh, acts on Christmas, uh, on, sorry, on uh, Easter Sunday, um, one thing that strikes uh, one is that this was perpetrated by a small group of extremists who don't even have the support of their wider community. This, of course, makes it much easier to contain the situation as it has transpired. And the security forces have done a tremendous job in getting on top of the situation already. And then as far as the events after, in the aftermath, the couple of weeks after that, again, I think what was heartening was the widespread condemnation of such events right across our society. People from all political hues, from different faiths, different ethnicities, Everybody condemned those acts out of hand. Uh, and so that, I think, again, has now created an environment where one hopes such um, orchestrated events will not be repeated. So in my own mind, I think we have certainly got past the worst and we have come to a reasonably good place uh, pretty quickly. And as I said, we need to be thankful to our security forces for getting us to where we are now. Okay. What about the economy? Uh, and what about the economic fundamentals, uh, which you need to be in sound shape for you to build your businesses? The first point I'd like to make is that on the 13th of May, the executive board of the IMF approved the fifth review of the extended fund facility. Now to us, that was an endorsement that the fundamentals of the Sri Lankan economy was in reasonable shape. If that was not the case, the executive board of the IMF would not have approved the review. And not only that, if you have read some of the, the commentary that the IMF has put out subsequent to the executive board decision, a lot of it has been very helpful. They have indicated that they're confident that Sri Lanka is not likely to have any risks in terms of refinancing its debts. They are confident that we will be able to meet our obligations. That was a, an extremely constructive endorsement that the country has received. Of course, they did say that we need to pursue fiscal consolidation, we need to continue with our prudent monetary policy and flexible exchange rate management, we need to do more structural reforms, all that was pointed out. But they were basically satisfied that the fundamentals of the economy were in reasonable shape and were in a good enough condition for them to approve the fifth review of the extended fund facility. So that's the first message I'd like to give to you. Then now what I'd like to do is to go through some of the macro, the, the real economy, the growth rate, and some of the key macroeconomic variables to make the case that they are in okay shape. They're not in brilliant shape, but they're certainly in pretty good shape. So let's take the growth rate. As you all know, growth came down to 3.2% uh, last year, um, from 3.4% the year before that. Now the central bank calculates the potential growth rate at 5%. So clearly we have a, an output gap. 
we should be doing better. And the reason for the, for the slowdown of the economy last year, one of the main reasons was the contra contraction in the construction sector, which actually contracted by 2.1%. So that's basically, that's one area where we need to improve. So what's going to happen this year? Um, as of the 18th of April, the central bank's forecast for growth this year was 4%. The IMF was at 3.5%. But clearly there will be a hit, particularly in the tourism sector and its supply chains and the whole ecosystem around tourism is likely to take a hit, clearly, we know that. Beyond that, <laughs> another sector is that the, the retail sector has taken a bit of a hit. And of course, people's incomes will be affected, which means that aggregate demand uh, will be less, and that will, again, have an impact on the growth rate. But having said that, it must also be recognized that very large swathes of the economy have been untouched. Agriculture has been untouched. If you look at the manufacturing capacity, I'm talking now about the productive capacity of the economy. If you look at the manufacturing sector, of course, there was that pasta plant uh, in the Northwest province that was destroyed. But outside that, I don't know of any significant manufacturing capacity that has been affected. In the services sector, certainly tourism and retail, as I said, have been affected. But as there's enough of the economy that's untouched for us to have a robust bounce back once the security situation is normalized, and it seems that we are getting there. And once confidence, it's really uh, the sentiment and confidence as far as Sri Lankans are concerned, that is important. We need to be confident that the security forces have done their job, which they have done. So now we need to move ahead. So that's the growth sector. Let me now uh, 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 go on to some of the uh, uh, also, I should say, uh, in terms of the creating the right environment for growth, particularly for recovery in the tourism sector, uh, the government is really operating on three fronts. One is security. Significant advances have been made. And on the back of that, we are beginning to see the travel advisories relaxed. China, Germany, and Switzerland have moved already. Uh, there is talk that India might do the same. And some of the other countries, I understand the U.S. is now ready to bring back its families of people working here. Uh, so we are beginning to see movement, and clearly we need to build on that, and we need to accelerate that as much as possible. Okay, let me now look at the different macroeconomic variables uh, and start uh, with the, uh, the financial markets. What's been interesting is that since the 18th of April, which was the last working day before Easter Sunday, if you look at the government securities market, we have had six treasury bill auctions, the sixth one being today. On each occasion, the yields have come down. On the one-year benchmark treasury bill rate, the yields have come down by about 102, 103% since the 18th of April. We had the largest bond auction ever, 120 billion. I think it was Monday before last. Again, the yields came down. You look at our international sovereign bonds. On the 18th of April, we issued a dual tranche, five-year, 10-year uh, ISBs in March. On the 10-year issuance, yields were down about 80 basis points. On the, on the five year, about 65. Now they have widened. They're, they're about 10 basis points below the issuance price. However, despite everything, the price is still inside the cost at the time of issuance, which is an indication to us that these markets are still open to us. And when I continue with my remarks, you will know why that is important. So if you look, as I said, financial markets, the impact has been contained, and that's something which was corroborated in the statements made by the IMF as well. So what about the external account? 
the current account deficit worsened from 2.6% of GDP to 3.2% last year. There were multiple causes. There were exogenous causes like the tightening of US interest rates, the strong dollar, um, the, the uh, uh, oil prices, and there were domestic sources of pressure like gold imports and motor vehicle imports. Now, the external environment has become much more friendly. The US Federal Reserve has moved to a much more dovish, patient uh, stance. And the chances are that US interest rates may even come down at least once, maybe even twice, uh, before the end of the year. So that, that short source of pressure has taken, been taken away. And oil prices, they have gone up a little bit recently, but they came down and have gone up. And we, we have priced oil, the average price of oil, at 74 US dollars. That is the basis on which the planning has taken place for the budgetary forecast, for the uh, balance of payments forecast. So the price still hasn't gone above that, the Brent crude price. It's roughly a little bit below that. So again, for the moment, as long as prices don't go up any further, it's something we can absorb. Then if you look at the other sources of pressure, we equalized the duty between Sri Lanka and India, took away the, the arbitrage opportunity and the incentive to smuggle, and gold imports have come down. So that pressure has gone. Motor vehicle imports, the government was very keen to give people the opportunity to acquire a, a motor car and reduce the duty on um, small motor vehicles. And motor vehicle imports doubled last year and put strong pressure on the trade account and threw that to the current account deficit. Again, corrective action has been taken, duties have been increased, various macroprudential measures have been taken, and motor vehicle imports have come down significantly. The upshot of all this is that while the current account deficit went from 2.6% to 3.2% last year, in the first quarter of this year, the trade deficit came down from 3 billion, which it was in the first quarter of 2018, to 1 1.7 billion. So down from 3 billion to 1.7 billion, the trade deficit. Then last year, there was capital flight. There was $1 billion which went out from the government securities market. Foreign investment in the government securities market, about a billion dollars flowed out, again putting pressure on our currency. Um, this year, so far, the outflows, despite everything that has happened, the outflows have only been 77 million US dollars. Again, the consequence of all that is that the rupee, which depreciated by 16.4% last year, has in fact appreciated by 3.6%. It had actually appreciated by about 4.4%. But there was some depreciation, and now it has stabilized again. So the rupee, despite everything, is 3.6% stronger than it was at the end of last year. So again, on the external front, yes, things have got worse. And in fact, we had originally forecast the current account deficit to come down from 3.2 to 2.3% of GDP. Now, because of the result of all this, uh, and particularly the hit on tourism, uh, we think that the current account deficit, it will be less than 3% still. It will come down from 3.2 to something a little less than 3%, maybe 2.7, 2.8% of GDP. So despite all this, we should get a better outcome than last year on the current account deficit. Now, what thing, the thing that people are most worried about is, can we, do we have enough reserves to service our external debt? We all know that our external debt dynamics are very, very challenging. And there are our reserves at the moment. So the question is, do we have enough reserves to meet our commitments? So at the moment, our reserves are about 6.5 billion US dollars. On the 18th of April, our forecast, our projection rather, for the end year reserve number was US dollars 8.2 billion. And that was predicated on us borrowing another 2 billion US dollars from the markets, commercial markets abroad. Okay, so what is the worst case scenario? What can happen? And can we raise this $2 billion? Let me try and answer those two questions. 
Let's take the worst case scenario. Uh, it, tourism earnings for this year were projected at 5 billion US dollars. Central Bank now thinks that will come down to, to 3.7. We will lose about 1.3 billion US dollars as far as tourism. Now we must take two factors into account there when we look at the losses this year. One is that we got good results up to the middle of April. In fact, in the first quarter of this year, tourism earnings increased by 4.5%. So that has already been banked. So the losses are only going to be over the last seven and a half months. And there, there is a bit of space, a bit of leeway, because May and June are the off season. And then, of course, July, August has a pickup, and then there's a lull, and then we get into the, to the, the peak season again. So we have a few months to get the travel advisories off, to do the promotion work, to minimize the impact. So if you take all that into account, um, the central bank forecast, as I said, is, one, uh, is a 1.3 billion loss from 5 billion to 3.7. Of that 1.3 billion, you have to net out the 30% import component in the tourism sector. So the, the net loss is likely to be something like 900 million, let's say 900 million. So in the worst case scenario, we lose 900 million on tourism. Then we have 900 million US dollars of foreign institutional investment in the government securities market. As I said, we've only lost 77 million so far, but let's assume 300 million. It won't happen, but the worst case scenario is you lose another 300 million on that. Then the other avenue where we could have a less good outcome than we originally anticipated was foreign direct investment. We anticipated 2.7 billion US dollars of foreign direct investment. Let's assume that we lose 700 million there, that we end up with, with two, million, 2 billion. So you add all that up, 900 million on tourism, 300 uh, million on, on, for, on outflows from government securities, 700 million of foreign direct investment. You add all that up, that's about 1.9 billion. So we're saying our reserves were going to be 8.2 billion. You take 1.9 billion off, and you're ending up you know, with about 6.3 billion. Our current reserves are about 6.5. That is not a wonderful level of reserves, but it's nowhere near a crisis either. So even if we, under this worst case scenario, we will have, we think, an outcome where there will not be a crisis and we will be able to meet our commitments. And as insurance, after the political difficulties of the fourth quarter of last year, when the yields on our international sovereign bonds spiked to, to default levels, we thought at that time, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, that we won't be able to go to the markets and borrow money. As it transpired, they came down and we, went, we have already gone and borrowed 2.4 billion. But at that time we had doubts, so we arranged a 400 million swap with the Reserve Bank of India, 400 million US dollar. We arranged a 1.7 billion USD swap with the People's Bank of China, and we have arranged a 1 billion swap with the Central Bank of Qatar. So we have 3.1 billion of swaps on a standby basis. I should say that the People's Bank of China swap is in, in Yuan, the uh, Qatar uh, central bank swap is in real. So there will be conversion costs which would make this money expensive. But if worse comes to worse, if push comes to, swap, to shove, that 3.1 billion is also available as a buffer, as a, as a, uh, a, a, a standby facility. So if you take all this together, I think, I hope there is a convincing case to say that we can meet our commitments. Another point to make is that as of today, we have met 65% of our external debt obligations for this year. There were two sovereign bond maturities, 1 billion in January, 500 million in April, they have been paid. There was a 330 million obligation on a syndicated loan, that has been paid. So we have a bit of leeway in the second half. The, the external debt repayments were front loaded in 2019 and we have met them. And fortuitously, the external debt repayments for next year is backloaded. The next sovereign bond payment is actually in October of 
2020. So we have a bit of time, a bit of leeway in terms of the pressure, in terms of our external debt repayments. And, but for all this to work, we have to be able to borrow two billion US dollars from the external markets this year. Are we likely to be able to do it? So far, we have a number of options before us. Our bankers tell us that there is still appetite for Sri Lankan paper. That people have the view, rightly or wrongly, simply because Sri Lanka has never missed a payment, that the Sri Lankans will do what it takes to meet their commitments. That is the perception in the market, and clearly we must maintain that. So, so far, we will have access to those markets, it seems. And we will go into the market fairly quickly. So we could do another international dollar-denominated sovereign bond. Also, JBIC, the Japanese uh, agency, has offered us a guarantee to go and raise a samurai bond in the Japanese market. So that is another option. The People's Bank of China has said they will hold our hand if we want to go and raise a panda bond. Uh, uh, so Sri Lanka is friends, uh, you know, are definitely uh, stepping up to help us if we need it. And um, so if the other option, of course, is to get a term loan. And there, the World Bank has a facility called a policy-based guarantee. And they have stepped up as part of the support in the wake of these events. Normally, a policy-based guarantee requires reforms. They have said they will cluster together the reforms that we have already done or we are close to completing to make us eligible for this guarantee. And what this guarantee does is they will set aside a certain amount of exposure. It seems the limit is about 250 million. That can be leveraged four times over, so that's a billion dollars. We can borrow, not, not, not through an international bond, but through a loan from an international bank. We can borrow up to one billion on the World Bank's AAA guarantee. Not on our, 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 our rating, but on the World Bank's AAA uh, rating. So that's something the World Bank has stepped up uh, in terms of assisting Sri Lanka. So if you take all that together, we feel fairly confident that we can manage this situation. I should also mention, uh, on the fiscal front, there will be some pressure. Clearly on the revenue side, um, VAT, income tax, import duties are likely to be affected. In addition, there will be expenditure, there will be security-related expenditure, there will be compensation payments. So the government is reviewing the whole budget. It will do so during the course of June. And the idea is to reprioritize and to try to accommodate as much as possible through expenditure switching and to minimize the additional uh, expenditure, the incremental expenditure, because if there is incremental expenditure, we will either have to raise taxes or we will have to borrow more, neither of which are really very good outcomes. So one would need to minimize that. So the government will try to shift expenditure around to accommodate the new priorities uh, 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 without putting pressure on the system. And here, there, of course, the Indian, new Indian Revenue Act is bringing in quite a lot of money. Uh, that's working well so far. So that's really, I've taken you through each of the uh, kind of macro, key macro variables. Um, I, you know, so to summarize, growth is low. It's going to be lower, that's for sure. But we need to keep working on the structural reforms that are slowly coming into place to get growth up going forward. But in terms of stability of the economy, it's in reasonably good shape. And the foundation is good for all of you now to work very hard in getting your businesses back up to speed and to work as hard as you can. I should have also said that you know we have provided a financial package for the tourism sector. Uh, there's a moratorium. Uh, there is also uh, some relief uh, in terms of working capital, which has to be worked through. Some relief in terms of the VAT which again has to be worked through. Uh, you know, all these things, when you first introduce them, it takes a bit of time. They do have glitches. But I think there's goodwill on all sides for us to work these things out. With that, let me just finish by saying, as I say, uh, you know, things are okay. We can manage it. We can manage it. 
but we need to maintain discipline. We need to maintain discipline on finance, on the, on the government finances. We need to maintain discipline in the central bank in terms of monetary policy. If we do that, this is a very manageable proposition. Thank you.